Sharon Geller, welcome to the show. Voiceover actor, actor, uh, theater, theater yes. as well. Outstanding, outstanding. Four times on SNL. We were talking offline, so I definitely want to talk about SNL because I'm a big fan of the uh, the Eddie Murphy days and the Phil Hartman days and and oh, the, and, and those Dana Carvey days. So uh, oh, those, yeah, for me, that, that those were the highlights. But um, yeah. yeah, Sharon Geller, uh, tell me a little bit more about who you are, what you do, what you've been up to. Well, uh, who I am is basically what you just said. Uh, I tend to do a lot of comedic spots. So I do drama as well, but many more comedic spots. I get cast in a lot of radio and TV commercials, either as a comedic character or lighthearted. Um, and that's okay with me because comedy is my first love. I mean, I, I grew up loving comedy and comedy characters. I mean, Gilda Radner was one of my idols for the longest time yeah, on uh, Gilda SNL. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it's old days were just magical. And um, yeah, and of course, Tracy Ullman. But, but back in the day, you know, I grew up loving yeah, Carol Burnett. And I used to watch that with my dad when I lived uh, with my parents. Um, so today, for the last, I'd say, 25 years, I've been earning my living as a comedic actress, doing radio and TV commercials. I'm in the national touring company of an off-Broadway show called old jews telling jokes <laughs> that I absolutely love uh okay. and we can talk more about that later but um oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. so a lot of what i do circles around comedy and obviously it's had its challenges in the last uh, year and a half for for the well-known reasons but i feel luckier than most yeah my wife's jewish and so we were we get a big kick obviously out of you know seinfeld and then um yes. and curvy enthusiasm um oh, oh and <laughs> old Jews telling jokes, that's going to have to be a watch. Right, for sure. Well, you know, it's an homage. It's a tribute to the Borscht Belt. And if you're not familiar with that, the Borscht Belt is that area in the Catskill Mountains in New York mm -hmm. uh, that gave birth to all of those comedians like Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, Buddy Hackett back in the day, of yeah. course, uh, Milton Berle, you know, Mel Brooks, Woody Allen. So all of those Jewish comedians were spawned out of the Borscht Belt, because this was a time in the 50s and 60s when Jews actually were not allowed to entertain at mm -hmm. other kinds of places. They were, Jews were excluded. So uh, the Borscht Belt was born, uh, and that was in the Catskill Mountains, a series of hotels with entertainment at night. And all of that Jewish comedy that you're talking about, plus old Jews telling jokes, it's like a, a knighted vaudeville. It's all of that Jewish humor that was spawned out of that era. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my wife gives me a hard time. Um, I'm, I, I wasn't Jewish before, maybe since I married her, you know, maybe I'm now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, watching, watching Curb, she gives me a hard time. I'm, I'm probably the most uh, vanilla uh, uh, <laughs> Gentile person that she might have ever thought she'd marry. And yet she compares me to Larry David with my stubbornness and... Um, <laughs> And my and, and my and, and my bitterness and my refusal to you know relent and my refusal to admit I'm wrong. But I think not only is it, but I don't think that's necessarily like a Jewish guy thing. I think that's just a guy thing in general. I was going to say, but you should end that sentence with, "But she loves me anyway." But she loves me anyway, of course. 
because you just decided, you just sounded like someone who I don't want to meet. <laughs> but that, <laughs> no. but that is very funny. And I think you're right. I think a lot of people can have that attribute, but because Larry David is so well known, now I know exactly what you mean when you say that type of personality. Yeah. You know, in the show, Larry's Jewish, his wife's Gentile. She gives him a hard time. And they're, especially with this one episode where they're at this campfire with friends and he left a jacket in his car. He left his car unlocked. Great. One of his wife's friends just went through his car, grabbed his jacket and put it on because she's cold. And now he goes to look for it. It's not in there. Yeah. And he goes back and he sees her wearing it. And he's like, I'm what the what the yeah. hell? Like, I'm going to I'm going to rip this one. And I'm going to rip this woman a new one. She's like, leave it alone. He goes, are you kidding me? This is my jacket. I right. brought my jacket. It was in my car. And she's just going to walk around. And this whole episode. And now my me and my wife's relationship is, is reversed when it comes to like the, the upbringing and, and, and the religion. And it would be it would have been the same exact situation. Same I know, exact I know. situation. Uh, uh, someone wrote a whole book, and I can't remember the person's name, about the difference between wasps and Jews. And one of the th things that stuck in my mind most is, let me see if I can get this saying right. Uh, wasps leave a party and never say goodbye and jews say goodbye but they never leave yes <laughs> and that is yes it's so indicative of of you know the jewish mentality yeah but anyway you could appreciate that i'm sure yeah there was a whole episode of curb where it was like don't you don't you say goodbye <laughs> and he's like yes goodbye i was gonna say goodbye <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, that rings true. That rings true. So how, uh, you know, you, you were talking a little bit about getting back into it. You've been doing this for 25 years. How have you, you've been impacted the last year, year and a half? Well, um, very much so like everybody else. And, um, you know, when the pandemic first started, I mean, nobody is psychic and I didn't know we'd be stuck like this for 18 months and counting. Um, one of the first things that happened was I teach for years, I teach comedy improvisation at the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. And um, I had never heard of the word Zoom, didn't know what it was. And uh, yeah, I know it's embarrassing to admit, but it's true. And uh, so I found out how to teach improv which you know just blows my mind because that in itself is an interactive discipline and I thought can I teach this on zoom that sounds like the antithesis it's not like I'm teaching chemistry you know and um, I figured out a way to do it because uh, and to make it interesting you know I always feel when that when I'm teaching it's like hosting a party you have to make sure everybody's engaged you're the host you got to make sure everybody's having a good time because if they're not then they're not going to listen and I feel like that when I teach in person so you can imagine like it's tenfold when you're doing it on zoom mm -hmm. and some of the things that I've been teaching for years I could transfer over to a zoom uh, improv class other things I couldn't do at all, all and some I just had to do what I teach in improv which is think outside of the box and adapt and um i learned how to use zoom which i know sounds so like oh you're such a big girl you learned how to use zoom <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's like yeah well you know it's for someone who's not a techie and that would be me mm. um you know knowing how to use zoom and not being afraid of it was really a big step anyway so i've been doing that i teach an advanced comedy improv class for years i've been doing that on zoom I've even been, um, I teach improv for lawyers at Drexel Law School and improv and interview skills for neuroscientists at the University of Pennsylvania. All of those things I've continued online. Plus, uh, there's a show that I do. And uh, I do uh, one, sh one performance, one program that I do is for lawyers. It's a CLE, which is Continuing Legal Education. And that is called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Arbitration. And that's something I've done for... 15 years in person and I transferred that to Zoom. And then I do a show for Jewish groups, synagogues, Jewish federations called Knock Knock Jews There, a Talmudic take on comedy. And it's all about the importance of laughter and humor in Judaism with examples from the Torah and the Talmud, which with a lot of Borscht Belt stuff thrown in. So yeah, so all of that stuff I've managed to continue doing on Zoom. But I have to tell you, before any of that happened back a year and a half ago, the first thing I thought is, okay, we're not going to be stuck that long like this. So, but what can I do? I want to do something creative. And the first thing that occurred to me was 
how are people doing internet dating? I mean, how do you meet someone for a date when half your face is covered with a mask? So I just, you know, I've written comedy sketches and I, and I had this great idea. Meanwhile, I have a partner who's very funny in Israel. She's a a very comedy, very funny uh, comedian. Uh, She does a lot of TikTok stuff. She works for a big radio station in Israel. And she calls me one day. She says, Sharon, I want to write something with you. And I said, you know, I'm already writing a sketch. Why don't we do it together? And I called it coronamatch.com. And it's it's like an SNL parody of internet dating because it's all about how do you find your one true love when you're covered with a mask Mm -hmm. and the benefits of that happening. So I had sent you that link. I don't know if you had a chance to look at the at the three minute parody, but it's a pretty funny link and uh, got a ton, a ton of compliments on it and views. So I was just trying to stay creative. This is a long answer to a short question. I was just trying to stay creative by writing that and per- I was in it, I performed it, I cast it, you know, just to get the creative juices flowing. And then sometime after that is when all the Zoom teaching and performing started. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to uh, the voiceover work, I think I did one or two voiceovers throughout the quarantine. Uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of foreseeing the quarantine. And I'm such a I'm such a big movie buff. I've seen the movie Contagion. I've seen all these zombie movies. I've seen all right. uh, I've seen Take Shelter. And I just happened to, to watch the movie Take Shelter again, uh, starring Michael Shannon and Jessica Chastain, which is a mind blowing, incredible independent film. Uh, definitely worth a watch. Um, I watched it for the second time last night, but I've seen all those things. And so I heard about this and I saw how they were kind of making a big, big deal about it. So I started getting ready, started hunkering down, worked my last couple of gigs. And, and, but luckily for me, whether it be luck, whether it be hindsight, whether it just be, I'm blessed, you know, and I think it's a combination of all three is that I've always delved into the, into the live streaming aspect of audio and audio, video, film, and TV, live streaming, um, some remote work. I've always been trying to work my way to a career that was working from home, mostly. Have a home studio, do a, me and some partners failed at the podcast twice before. Right. And I was hearing about Zoom and, and looking at the prices and Zoom would have been the best option for us to pull off this podcast before. Then of course, quarantine happens. It's like, yeah, I mean, there's nothing going on. Might as well pay that premium premium price. Right. Make, you know, kick off this podcast once again, make that, try to make that happen. Right. Um, and this has been going on. There was a lot of, a lot of stuff that a lot of passion projects I shot had in the can, just started knocking, just started knocking them out, started editing and putting stuff out because I didn't have the time to edit these passion projects because on gig from gig from gig set to set to set to set event 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 it was non-stop and it was great money and i love set life i cannot stand editing but when it comes to these passion projects and there's no money it's like listen i'm gonna have to edit it myself because i can't afford an editor i'm good at it i can't but i can't stand it but you know maybe i kind of saw it coming in such a way that it was like when it hits i'll we're going to be set we're yeah. if it doesn't i'll be right back on set if it if it does hit i got stuff i can do here and i'll be well, yeah i'm just the opposite of you because i know that i can do things from here but i would always much rather be performing out in the world first oh, of yeah. all i love my, doing theater live theater we know what's happened to that in the last year and a half mm-hmm. and so that's really been hard um the voiceover work that i've done over the last year and a half i've done by going into a professional studio and i was asked to do that and i said yeah you know at this point where everybody's vaccinated and i'm there with one engineer totally like a football stadium studio so i feel totally safe doing that but um yeah i just i'm the exact opposite i if i people used to say to me before the pandemic um if I had an audition in New York or why would you go up to New York for a voiceover audition when you can just submit, self-submit, you know, save yourself like a trip, I think, because I would always rather 
be in person and meet the casting director and meet the people in the room because nothing beats personal connection. And then you get to get feedback and direction from the client who's in the room. Could you do that again, but like a little slower? Or could you do that again with more energy? Yeah. And that's something that, you know, I can self-submit and give them the best copy that I did. And that's, a, and that's nice too. I can do it 10 times before I send them one. But then I'm trying to be psychic. What do they want? What what I'm trying to please them and give them the best job. And I it would be much better if I was in the room with them and doing it. So I always feel like I would rather be out there uh, person to person, but no one asked me what I wanted. So <laughs> before the pandemic began. So I'm just trying to roll with the punches like everybody else. Yeah, you know, as far as acting goes. You know, my my military and my 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 military police experience, you know, having done that in the military has been my acting. And I and I know my strengths as an actor mm -hmm. going back, going back to like, you know, living for set life. I started dabbling into acting. Only playing law enforcement or military roles for the sake of. All right. There's no A.D. gigs right now. There's no camera op gigs. Mm -hmm. I got a big chunk of open space on my schedule. So I just started applying to acting roles as a detective this, officer that, lieutenant this, you know, sergeant that, whatever the case, law enforcement and or military roles. And that started filling the schedule. And then when it came to the self-submits, again, I know my strengths. An actress like yourself could play a whole variety of things, but me, I'm gonna hone in on where my strengths are, law enforcement, military. I'm gonna apply to all those. And yes, I could spend an hour driving to an audition, spend two hours at this whole audition, maybe three hours at this whole audition process, drive an hour back. That's been five hours of my day, whereas I can knock out 10 self-submits in five hours at home because really it's just going to be me playing detective this right. in, the, in, the, in 1960s or Sergeant that in a futuristic post-apocalyptic right. or, or anywhere in between law enforcement military roles right. and what they what they what you see is what you get it's going to be the real life you know staff sergeant nelson from the military right as far as crew goes that military experience you know they want to ad they want to you know you don't have to you don't really have to audition for the crew work you have to have a decent resume and right. and, the, and that military experience is always kind of a a, a boost on, on that crew resume but in my case, for a lot of actors, maybe starting off, just churn out those self submits. When modern and and again, even po even pre COVID, modern technology self submits. I, I would churn out, you know, probably a hundred self submits a week, but maybe go to one audition, two auditions in person a week. But right. my schedule was steadily filled with acting gigs, and then it got to a point where casting directors or ads or producers would call me direct and be like, "Hey." we need you to fill in. Can you fill in these days? And we, 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 you know, negotiate the schedule. Yeah. I didn't have to audition because I know my strengths. They know my strengths. They wanted it last minute. They called me in, but that schedule started to get steadily filled with acting work with a particular character. Every once in a while, I would get that killer, that, 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 that perp or that killer role uh or the stepfather role you know the generic stepfather and, and i'm more than happy i'm more than happy because like like you said that set life was the life man just like bouncing from set to set doing different things here and there and, every, and every, anywhere and everywhere in between but again also having those technical skills of say uh um live streaming and knowing zoom and editing Thank God, because that's when the quarantine did happen. It's like, hey, let's, you know, I got to stay active. Got to stay creative. Let's talk to, you know, fellow creatives like you that ain't doing shit for the last six months. And it sucks. Let's talk about what you were doing. Let's talk about how you're, you know, staying creative and productive now. What's next on the plate? And just share, you know, good stories, bad stories and every, everything in between and make that the thing during the quarantine. And Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think what you're saying, both of your stories illustrate that necessity is the mother of invention, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you and I are both doing things now that we might uh, not have chosen to do uh, before the pandemic or in this style 
to, to do the thing, but not in the style. And we're just, you know, trying to make lemonade out of lemons. Yep. Uh, I know I would always rather return to in-person gigs. And for a while, like back in June, when it was safe, when, when everybody was vaccinated, uh, I, I did a few in-person gigs. I did a comedy improv show with a, with a corporate team that I do for a big international group. Um, it was outside. It worked perfectly. Everybody yeah. was vaccinated. I did another thing at a senior uh, upscale uh, retirement community. Again, everybody's vaccinated. I feel safe. Everything is great. And then, of course, the Delta variant comes. Right. So we're all just making it up as we go along and trying to figure out what's safe, what's not safe, and and you know, just making sure that we can continue to do what we love in a very safe way. Because, of course, Nobody wants to get sick. Obviously, yeah. I yeah, I constantly feel like I'm just like making it up as I go along. Improv, what I teach, you know, I'm just making it up as I go along, and I my behavior gets dictated by the science. Yeah, absolutely. I I couldn't agree with you more on on, on the behavior being dictated by the science. Right. But you know, for me, there were there's always like, okay, there's this workaround. I can still finish these projects somehow. Right. Um, let's experiment. And that's the biggest, and that's one big thing for me that, that some of my colleagues, it drives them nuts. Like what, what the hell are you doing now? I'm like, let's experiment. Let's, let's see what we can pull off with zoom. Let's see what we can pull off. If you're some, if you're, you're on, you just happen to be at the beach in Virginia and I'm in the woods in, in Maryland, you shoot some stuff. I shoot some stuff. We'll see what comes together with it. You know, you know, whatever. And, and, and see what, see what we can make out of it. But uh, I'll tell you what, I am constantly amazed in my comedy improv classes, the creativity that has come out of the Zoom performances. I never would have thought until I saw it how creative people can be. I yeah. mean, I think when we're forced to literally think outside of the box, we really, we really can. Because yeah. I have seen stuff that would have never happened if I was teaching in person. So the the creativity and the thinking outside of the box, which is just another way of saying problem solving, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff that I see in my comedy improv classes are fantastic. That SNL parody, uh, not SNL parody, but that SNL type parody that I did called coronamatch.com about dating during the pandemic, that would have been something I never would have done if I hadn't been locked down. Right. With thinking, what can I do that's creative? Uh, and, you know, thanks to my partner, uh, Abishag Yade in Israel, who did such a great job of editing that and adding in sound and things like that. We come up with this creative thing. We never would have done it. I'm sure we never would have done it had we not been forced to think outside of the box. So um, a lot of this stuff is like when you're creative, it's hard anyway in this country to be a self-employed creative person because unless you're at the top of the totem pole, you know, everybody understands what Robert De Niro and Meryl Streep do, but most people don't understand how you can earn a living doing medical industrials and voiceovers on the lower end of that ladder, right? Mm -hmm. So it, because people don't know your name. So, I mean, there are ways to do it, obviously, but I remember many times in my life when people would say to me, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm an actor. And like, what do you mean? Uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm an actor I, I do right and, and they don't understand yeah. so I have to give them an example because they understand oh you do radio commercial oh you do tv commercial. you know so they they understand that you have to give them something concrete which you know sometimes you have to do you have to explain who you are yeah you gotta explain it. <laughs> like you actually have to explain it you yeah. actually have to you, you, sometimes you might actually have to explain it differently these days how are you still an actor or whatever well this is true yeah. Um, I, and you know, it's something funny that you said in the beginning about whether it was luck or blessings or a, a little bit of thinking outside of the box or everything. Mm -hmm. I feel that way too. I mean, listen, all of my life, I used to be in the corporate world for 10 years before I started acting full time. Mm -hmm. And once I started acting full time all my life, I thought, gee, it wouldn't be cool to shoot a national TV commercial. I would just love to do that. And the day before lockdown, I shot a national TV commercial. And what a blessing that was, not just to have done that and had a great experience on set with wonderful actors, but to have shot a national TV commercial that is a union uh, residual paying job. 
what a wonderful time to be getting residual checks. Right. I mean, I just, it's such a blessing that it, it just happened to fall out that way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I always feel so grateful for everything that I get because it's such a blessing to be able to earn your living doing what you love and not have to like grow away doing something that you hate. So, so many people are trapped in jobs for different reasons. I remember reading this article once, uh, Jay Leno said to uh, someone as a response to how he got to be who he is. And he said, listen, I used to hang out on a corner with like five other friends and we were all very funny, Both some of them were funnier than me, he said, um, but this is what happened, life, life gets in the way, so this one got married and had a baby, and obviously, you got responsibilities, right, when you have a family, and this one went off and, and did something else, and, they, and he said, so what would happen is, I'd call up these friends, because we always did the midnight set at the comedy club, and I'd call them up, and I'd say, hey, you going tonight to the, the old-fashioned phone, you going to to that to that midnight set and they would say oh, i have to get up at five o'clock in the morning oh i didn't know you got a full time yeah i needed health insurance for the yeah. kid you know so life gets in the way and understandably so if you have a kid you have responsibilities there's no question about it but he said that he was always so diligent and so driven that you know that that's how he got to be where he is um and i think that you have to have an element of that it's hard to juggle everything but i think that that's some of what goes into it yeah, it's a lonely road. And, uh, you know, I really started to, you know, get the, you know, get my film and acting career off the ground about 90, 30, uh, uh, 2015, or 2017, maybe. And late 2016 is what when I met my now wife. And, you know, we were dating. And, you know, things it, it was, you know, it was steadily, you know, kind of, but the 35 years, 36 years prior to that, I was, I had, I stayed diligent with, you know, it's a lonely road. I'll, if you want to do what you want to do and, and do it well. And when it, especially when it comes to filmmaking, it comes to music, it comes to acting. I mean, it's a lonely road until you really start really kick off that career. And that's what it was. And, you know, I had gotten back from a deployment and I just hit the ground running with acting and more film gigs, uh, more, more crew work, more acting work um live events anything right. and everything i could jump in and started getting that ball rolling started getting on people's you know first call list when it came to acting crew and live events and uh and then then i met her and things were continually growing and 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 being stable as a full-time freelance filmmaker and actor it was stable as we got engaged and then had and then got married and then had a kid that was the career but before that the 36 years the 37 years before that it was a lonely road well, so and, I think this is a matter of timing and you actually just said that because listen i was in the corporate world for 10 years in medical public relations and i would write press releases and public service announcements and book doctors on tv shows and i love that in the back of my mind, I always loved acting, but I honestly didn't think I could earn a living doing it, or I didn't understand how, and it's not because I didn't have confidence in myself. I just didn't understand how you could do that unless you were, you know, Meryl Streep or Robert De Niro. So over those 10 years, and I grew to, from loving that job, loving being in the corporate world, and because I was in a, the creative part of the corporate world, I was writing press releases, public service announcements, booking mm -hmm. up, TV show, to hating it because I was like, I am so trapped in this building and I think I'm going to scream. Right. And I always believed like, you know, timing is everything. So then one day my dad unfortunately passed away. Um, and that was my wake up call to life is short. And I don't want to be 50 one day and say, what is should have could have. And if I die tomorrow, am I happy doing what I'm doing? And I, I said, the answer is no. So um, I, I knew that I had to make a change. So what I did is I took a day off from work. Um, I, I went up to my mom's and at the time, Phil Donahue, the, the brilliant talk show host, had a show on at 9 a.m. in the morning. I, I watched it that day. Just so happens I was off from work. And what was his guess? His guests were six CEOs who all left their six figure income jobs to pursue their heart's content. And I listened to that show, Glenn, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm not making six figures and I hate what I'm doing. And 
Monday morning, I went into work and gave notice, but I'm not a fly by night person. So yes, I gave notice, but I gave myself a month to leave. And because I knew if I said it, then it would be true. And by the end of that month, I was gone. And I was so scared of being self-employed. I, my three biggest fears in working for myself, I was afraid that every day I'd sleep until noon. Right. I was afraid I'd have mint chocolate chip ice cream for breakfast. <clears throat> and I was afraid I'd watch soap operas all day long. Right. And I was so scared of those things happening with no structure except what I provided that I did the antithesis. I made myself get up every day at six o'clock in the morning, get out for coffee and fresh fruit and toast or whatever, and then go to the gym and then read the newspaper while I was having breakfast. So I, if nothing else happened by noon every day, I knew what was going on in the world. I was mm-hmm. out in the world. I was talking to people and I was up and out. And I swear to you, Glenn, since I left the corporate world i've never slept until noon i've never had mint chocolate chip ice cream for breakfast and i've never watched soap operas all day long so i i feel like you know that was my way that was my plan um because it's hard when you don't have that structure mm-hmm. i mean you know exactly i would get up and it would be you know 100 applications every other day mm-hmm. the day i wasn't doing the applications you know i would be editing something or i would be writing something or I'd be at the, you know, I'd be at the gym or I would you know, be doing something else, but it was, I would always start the day off with emails and gig applications nonstop, nonstop. And, uh, and, and then it was the next thing. Okay. If, if there's now, if there was a gig that day, the gig was first and I might, if we have downtime and if I had the capabilities, I take my laptop to that gig right. and I would, and I would, I would do the applications there. So. Yeah. I mean, I've never been busier. I've never been busier being full-time freelance and it, and it, and it keeps you, it keeps you motivated. Being that busy keeps you motivated to stay even busier. I so agree because I always say to people when I'm not working, I'm marketing myself. Mm -hmm. And that that was the other part of that, you know, leaving the corporate world. So then I would spend the afternoon after I had breakfast and I went to the gym and I read the newspaper. So I knew what current events were. I spend the rest of the day marketing. So let me do one thing for myself. That's about either sending out a resume, sending out a headshot, getting an audit, something that was there. And then right to this day, I do the same thing. I'm always marketing myself. And I remember when I was going for my radio, TV and film degree back at Temple University in communications, my BS in communications, I remember someone came to speak to us who was like a a local news person from one of the TV stations. And she said, first of all, you'll always be working if you have your own uh, project. So don't depend on other people. Don't wait for other people to hire you. Have something that you can take out there that you do. That's number one. And number two, don't sit back on your laurels and wait for your agent to call you because you will get much more work if you're always, you know, pounding the pavement. And I've, I've always done that. I mean, my agents have been great in getting me stuff, but if I just had sat at home waiting for the phone to ring, I, I wouldn't do any of the things I'm doing, half the things I'm doing, right? Because a lot of it is what you just said, being self-motivating, uh, self-motivated you have to be marketing yourself you have to be looking for the next job whether it's a live corporate event or whether it's uh you know uh, you're marketing yourself in with the producers and directors you already shot something with and you want to remind them that you're still alive you know it's and it's always something that you're doing to make sure that your name is out there yeah absolutely so you were talking a little bit about this theater um company i believe this performance or this class you were doing back in june have you been back on set have you been back in back on stage have you been back in the studio um and 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 if so doing what well one in-person gig that i did was um i just recorded four voiceovers for medicare which was lovely it was so great to be back in the studio Mm -hmm. um and again that was this huge studio with one engineer and um i felt totally safe and and it was a great um it was just great to be there you know to to not be doing it in my house but to be going out on set and as it were and doing that voiceover i had um an in-person gig uh doing my own show knock knock jews there a talmudic take on comedy at at an upscale retirement community 
um, in uh, Voorhees, New Jersey, and that was really well received. And again, it felt great to be out. I had another one for that international company I told you about. It was a comedy improv gig to help people think outside of the box. And that was totally safe because that one was actually outside of where the company is. So that was a really safe space. So little by little, it's creeping up, but uh, creeping back into the live in-person stuff. But you know, next week or in two weeks, I'm slated to do a show in person. I've got another thing I do with this Betsy Ross, uh, I, where she talks about her life as Betsy Ross in colonial garb. And it's a mix and mingle walk around. It's an interactive live event. And I was just asked about that. And that's for September. And who knows what's going to happen with the Delta variant? I don't know if their gig's going to get canceled or even if everyone's vaccinated, we already know what's happening with the Delta variant being yeah. more potent. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. But those are the kinds of things that I have been doing, you know, the, the radio commercials, the, the voiceovers, the theater stuff, the, you know, the improv stuff. So yeah, it's been, and next week I'm supposed to be doing something for Drexel for improv for lawyers. Okay. So, you know, we're hoping for the best, but again, who knows? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So what's next on, uh, you, you mentioned, you, you mentioned what's next on your agenda. Um, and, uh, some of the some of your future projects what drives you what is what's your driving force what drives you to pay my bills <laughs> it's true <laughs> but aside from that uh aside from that i love what i do so much i love doing comedic characters and making people laugh it's just i i I can't even explain. I feel I get so much more from my performances than my audiences do, even though they're so appreciative and they and they are so um, positive with their feedback and comments. It's just something that puts me in the most positive frame of mind. And I, I love contributing. I, I would never, like my accountant said to me, when are you going to retire? And I said, I should retire from something I love doing. I said, what right. do you think I am, an accountant? Right. <laughs> I don't want to retire from anything I love doing. So what drives me is I love what I do. I mean, it's very uh, addictive when you love something so much that you feel mm -hmm. like you have to do it. I, I love making people laugh. I love doing old Jews telling jokes because singing, there's a great song, Tom Lehrer. I don't know if you know the songwriter wrote this really funny song called I'm Spending Hanukkah in Santa Monica. And it's a really funny song. And I love singing funny lyrics and making people laugh. And and um, and I just love uh, the connection of, of being in the same room with people. And even when I'm doing my voiceover that I did last week, it was just the engineer and me, but the five clients were patched in by phone. And it's just really nice to get it right, to be told that that's exactly what someone was looking for, or that's what that's the kind of feel we want. It's just really nice because it's it means honing your craft and getting to what the client wants uh, and what sounds good and what most benefits them. So that's what drives me. I mean, I'm very motivated by that. Uh, I'm sure some Freudian psychologist will tell you this all has to do with when I was growing up, my father and I would listen. He was a big TV watcher and my father was very funny and he would always tell jokes and we'd watch the Carol Burnett show together and we'd laugh at all the funny characters that she did and um, everything. I mean, he loved, my father loved like sitcoms, everything from the Honeymooners. Uh, to the Red Skelton show. So now I'm dating myself. But the mm -hmm. point is, is that that's okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I'm sure the fact that my father and I were laughing together at that stuff had a lot to do with how, you know, comedy makes people feel and, and how fun it is to have a shared laughing experience with someone. Um, I'm sure that that had a lot to do with it. But that's not the only reason I just happen to love it, too. I mean, I'm also not good at math. I would never be a mathematician or a scientist because I really suck at those two things. But um, yeah, I was always I was always drawn to that um, because of those people like Gilda Radner and Tracy Ullman. And um, yeah, those characters were very infectious. Those first seven years of Saturday Night Live were just amazing. It was a magical time. And I, I can remember so vividly like the Eddie Murphy moments and yeah, yeah, and, you know, the Phil Hartman and, and just, oh, man, it, it's so many great sketches. And I was, I remember 
this is a time when everybody stayed home on Saturday night at 1130 because you didn't want to miss Saturday Night Live. That was where it's at. And and that was a really big part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. And I know I've mentioned it on my show a million times. And you kind of helped me like put it in the perfect kind of quotable quote, you know, those quotes that goes on, you know, pictures or whatever, pay your bills doing what you love. Right. And, and, and that's always been my goal. Right. That's success to me is, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, do music on the side and, and yeah, I'm a musician. And it's like, dude, I pay my bills doing what I love. And I've had some colleagues, I've had some former colleagues where I said, you know, some were musicians and, 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 and someone to be, you know, DJs, like, you know, live DJs at clubs or whatever. And I said, listen, I've got all these AV gigs and they're looking for, you know, audio technicians and you're just laying XLR cable, you know, for hours yeah, and right. you're, and you're hanging speakers and you're hanging lights Right. And you're and you're and you're plugging in microphones, man. I'm not trying to do all that, man. That's not, and the pay's really good, man. I'm not trying to do all that. I'm a musician, I'm a I'm a DJ, I'm a I'm a filmmaker, uh, I'm a you know I'm a camera you know I'm a camera operator. I'm like, okay. Fast forward five years, I know how to mic up my own voiceover deck, yeah, in my basement because right. of all these gigs and all these little technical ex technical you know expertises that I've gathered over the right. past five, 10 years. I know right. how to, I know how to set up a podcast. I know how to dabble. Now I have like this little DJ set and I know how to dabble with this DJ set. I know how to, I, I'm further experienced in camera operations, stuff like that from these, some might say, God awful, boring expos and conferences and seminars at, at this convention center, at that convention center, at this hotel, at the grand ballroom of that hotel, those, right. semi those seminars and those expos, but they got a couple camera setups and microphones. It's being live streamed to their website or being live streamed to their YouTube. And I've learned so much that now I'm actually doing what you say you do. Right. But I, but, but I learned so many skills. I've learned so much extra stuff from these set uh, from these events. Right. And I can relate to that because it's so funny how the things we learn along the way, along the journey of our life. Like mm -hmm. when I was in public relations for 10 years and writing press releases and public service announcements, and then I'm not because I'm acting full time. Guess what I do since I'm an actress? Right. I do follow up. I it used to be sending out picture postcards. If this is in public relations, I don't know what is. I When I used to send out like a, a five by seven uh picture postcard of my headshot at, for every job I had to like every casting director and, and producer or director I worked with on that set. Hi, I just wanted to thank you uh, for a wonderful experience. Hope we can work together again soon. Here's what, what I've been up to in the last month. Right. One radio commercial, one TV, you know, and then they get that in the mail. Of course, now I do it by email. They get that in the mail and then it's like, oh yeah, that's that girl we were, worked with two weeks ago on that set. So all of those PR skills that I learned in those 10 years, that served me well for doing follow-up once I became an actress and, and the importance of making sure your name is forefront, you know, making right. sure that it's there. And the other thing is, I always said, look, if I'm teaching a comedy improv class, I might rather be performing, but at least I'm teaching comedy improv, which in itself is so related to performing. I mean, if you're as a teacher, if you're not performing, I don't know what is uh, trying to make sure everyone's having a good right. time and making sure everyone's engaged. So at least I'm doing that. I'm not being a secretary and nothing against secretaries. Nothing against secretaries. Nothing no, against at all. Nothing against did, data administrators. Nothing I against. I was a secretary at a production place for a couple of years, so I have nothing against secretaries. Right. But I mean, at least teaching comedy improv is related to performing so yeah. i feel like every like what you're just saying everything that i'm doing is related to what i want to do yeah and you even you teaching it you'll get students that challenge you and you'll learn something always 
People Always. ask me all the time. They would say, even before the pandemic, when I used to like, sometimes I'd run up to New York. I studied for five years with Chicago City Limits in New York, which is kind of like what Second City is to Chicago, Chicago City Limits is to New York. So it's a comedy improv training ground and sketch group. And I studied with them for five years. And people used to say to me, you're still taking classes or you go up to New York to take class. And I oh, yeah, say, I do. Yeah, like, I don't know everything there is to know. Exactly. And if I just felt like I did, shame on me. Like, how can you how can you know everything there is to know? And plus, when you study with different directors or different teachers, you learn something you never knew before. Mm -hmm. And all of that stuff is then I can then pass it on to what I'm teaching. So there's always something new to learn. I don't think I know everything there is to know. And I, and I, I hate that I can't do that during the pandemic. But of course, what I can take advantage of is, or Zoom classes that, you know, I can zoom in from anywhere and learn a skill or learn something new or keep my juices, hone my creativity so that I don't feel I'm going stale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and for me, it's a little bit different. You know, like I, 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 I took some acting class, I guess, in high school and, you know, did some drama stuff in high school. And I worked with some no we didn't we didn't work with any drama students i never really took any acting classes and so for me the acting is the military police experience right. but for me and just for right now for me i don't have time for the classes i gotta get the gig after gig after gig after gig and then you know get the ball rolling on that and then bigger gigs and better gigs right. and then i can maybe i can take some time being a father that time is taken away so but sure. at some point maybe there's time like hey maybe i can take a couple of these uh what do you, what do you call them those acting seminars those acting uh uh workshops, workshops. thank you we're the acting workshop here and there yeah but there's no point i know where my skills are right now there's no point right now right the point right now is to fill in that schedule get the gig totally agree law enforcement military roles i'm yeah. your guy yep I've done it in real life. I've done it a million times on screen. Here's my reel. Here's my proof. Right. Uh, I won't let you down. Right. When it comes to, you know, more in-depth leading roles of, of really in-depth character. Now there's, there's better, more experienced, more, uh, uh, more uh, um, versatile actors out there for that. But yeah. you want, but you want that badass cop. You got it. You want that great interrogation scene. You know, those interrogation scenes and those crime thrillers and, and those crime shows, you know, uh, you know, I, I can nail that. But well, you yeah. have on the job training and, and then OJT. Yep. Yeah, there's something to be said for that, too. Yeah. So. So, you know, March 12th for me, March 12th, 2020 was when Maryland was put on lockdown. So March 12th, 2021 was really more like the new year for me. Not Jan not January 1st, right? right. But uh, now here we are, it's, you know, well past August, but what's, and then we had this whole word, the new normal, right. and, then, and then with New Year's, you know, there's this phrase, the new you, the new, new, year, new year, new you. But if I were to say, what's the new normal new you, the new year, new normal new you, what comes to mind, the new normal new you? Well, some of the things that I want to do uh, like continuous stuck, continuing my studies uh, online. I mean, I will do that if I find that I'm in a situation where, hey, we're back to wearing masks again. We're waiting to see what happens with the Delta variant. I mean, I have books, bo uh, gigs booked in the next month that I don't know if they're going to happen or not because they're in person. Right. I have other gigs booked that are online, which obviously will happen. So a lot of this is just, again, making it up as we go along and figuring out what's the best choice for me to make yeah. for uh, considering you know, health considerations because uh, you know, the health is of, of course the most important thing. So insofar as the new me, I mean, I, I was hoping had the Delta variant not presented itself, that I would have gotten back to like auditioning more in New York or, or auditioning, you know, more for uh, different gigs that I want. Now, 
we have to see because what the reality is is that a lot of casting directors are very happy with the online submissions. They don't have to rent studio space to meet people in person. And it's a very safe way to audition. So I have to acknowledge that that's the reality right now. So whether it means sending in a self-submission tape, you know, for a voiceover or for on camera, that's where we are right now. So as much as I would love for it to go back in person, nobody's asking me what I want. <laughs> and, we, and we have to just go with the flow. So if that's what it has to be, then that's what it has to be. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, and and, and it's going to be. A, it's not going to be as long as the whole year, you know, the the whole Delta variant thing. I, I, for for sure, it's only going to be like an additional month or two. I think you're hopefully, right. hopefully, you know, hopefully the vaccinations start, you know, going up, and 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 yeah. people people start get getting that, and and we work our way towards herd immunity. But it's not the end of the world. Even the Delta, even the quarantine wasn't the end of the world, as you can see, and we're still, we're all still here. And the Delta variant will be even less of a situation than the uh, than the main thing was. But, I think um, you're right. And I think the booster shot, which we're talking about this whole week, I think that's going to change the playing field. Mm -hmm. So so look, it's you know, even back before we even knew about the vaccine, I said way back when at the beginning of this, I said, this is this is not going to go on forever because we're going to have a vaccine by the end of the year. And friends right. of mine said like, you're crazy. It takes five years to get through FDA and blah, 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 blah. And I said, look, I'm not psychic, but this much I know this thing, this coronavirus is affecting every nation in the world, every person in the world. And I, you know, I always feel like it's going to a theater on opening night you can call the theater and they could say we're completely sold out. We don't have any seats left. And that could be true. But I can guarantee you that if the president of the United States and his wife want to attend opening night, somehow two seats miraculously appear. And that's exactly the way I felt about the Corona vaccine. I said, I know it takes five years to go through FDA. I know, I know, I know. But here's what I think. Everybody in the world is being affected by this. I can't believe that there are not scientists at work coming up with something that we're going to have by the end of the year and not because i'm so smart or i'm psychic i just thought it has to be and there yeah. was, and then it was so i agree with you i don't think it's going to be as bad as the initial thing and the boosters are going to help they already have them in israel and we're going to have them here and and then that's going to help so i do believe that it's going to go back to being a new normal but I do think it will go back and it's not going to last as long as the first one did the big word in that is normal yeah. Just what relax. The, yeah. The, the, the new normal, old normal, it's still going to be normal. It's not going to be like living in our basements for the rest of for the right. rest of our lives so i totally agree with you i i think that yeah and and we take safe risks too like i mean i i've been very conservative the last year and a half before the vaccine with masks but one thing i did every day was um i walked every day with a friend i have a bunch of friends who live near me and i would walk for two or three hours every day why because i used to go to the gym which i totally didn't want to go to anymore i haven't been there since march 2020 i used to go there three times a week to work out lift weights blah 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 Guess what? Even when they reopened in April 2020, I said to myself, they're not reopening because it's safe. They're reopening because they need money. Yeah. I'm not going back to a gym. I don't care what size the gym is where people are breathing heavy on, on uh, machines right. and working out. That doesn't sound safe to me. So I said to a friend of mine, you know what? At the end of this pandemic, people are either going to be very fat or very skinny. And I said, I am not going to end up in the hospital because I'm sick or for any reason related to being sick. So I just decided every day I'd be walking two or three hours and I kept that up and, and it made me feel great. And, and it made me feel like at least I'm doing something, you know, how your physical affects your mental outlook. Yeah. And I felt great doing that, being out in the air. So when I'm out in the air walking, no mask, even back in March, 2020, no mask because we're outside. Uh, inside was a different story. And, of and course, so yeah. Now, yeah. And so now here we are and I'm still walking two to three hours every day because I'm not going back to my gym. Yeah. So before I let you go, and we were coming, almost coming up on an hour. Before I let you go, I want to hear one or two awesome SNL stories. Well, uh, I have 
two that come to mind right immediately. First of all, I, I'm very lucky because every time I was on SNL, it was a different experience. The first one, which is always the most memorable one, is uh, Amy Poehler and I were Icelandic delegates at the UN. Chris Parnell was playing Colin Powell. And um, it, it was thrilling because it was the very first time I was on. And it was the opening sketch, which is to say that means you're on the set you know, doing that opening sketch and then you're there when that sketch ends and they say, live from New York, it's Saturday night and the band kicks in. Glenn, I, I have to tell you, I had chills going down my spine because all I could think of was, oh my God, I am sitting right where Gilda Radner sat. I am in Studio 8H at NBC, 30 Rockefeller. I mean, I'm here. It was thrilling to be in a sketch with Amy Poehler and and the first the opening sketch I, I would I was so scared the sketch might get cut because you know how they do those things you come in on a Saturday they write all those sketches that are very current mm -hmm. and then you do it for the first audience which is not the broadcast audience at 830 you do it for the first studio audience that comes in then when they leave Lauren Michaels cuts all the sketches that didn't fly right. and then at 10 10 o'clock, the new studio audience that you see at home comes in, and that's when you do that one for the third. So in between, you don't know if your sketch is going to continue. You don't know if you're going to like be in it. So when I found out that I was going, I didn't tell anybody because I was afraid, what if my sketch gets caught? And I said, hey, everybody, watch me on set. You know, so I only told my sister. And the next morning, because it didn't get cut, I got calls from people saying, call me crazy, but did I see you on Saturday Night Live in the opening sketch last night? And I was like, yeah, that was me. Yeah. So that, that was thrilling, Glenn, because that was the very and, first time. And that's that, a, that's, that a, that's that bonus payment. Oh, I from, can't. From, from, from doing this work and struggling to, oh. to, and struggling with this work. That's that bonus payment. Amazing. You're not kidding. Yeah. And then the second time I was on, I, uh, it was, uh, I, it was a, um, I was on the, uh, a different, um, SNL weekend update and I play, and Martha Stewart in real life had just gotten indicted and I played a waspy Connecticut woman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really, it was really funny. Anyway, uh, the, the la very last time I was on was 2007. This is a great story because Kanye West was the musical guest mm -hmm. and LeBron James was the host. Kanye West, I'm in a sketch that Seth Meyers, who was the head writer at the time, had written. And the sketch goes like this. I'm a Midwestern mom. We're at a county fair. My daughter just won a pumpkin contest. And she's about to get a blue ribbon by the county mayor, played by, uh, not Will Arnett, but oh my gosh, his name escapes me. Tall, thin guy. Anyway, he he's wearing the mayor, you know, the blue ribbon. And he's about to give her the blue ribbon my little eight-year-old daughter and kanye west comes in from nowhere and goes hell no and he grabs that ribbon out of her hand and like and goes on spurting about how this belongs to him now in hindsight when i used to tell that story about this funny sketch that seth meyers wrote i would always say didn't uh, Kanye West have a wonderful sense of humor about having ripped the award out of Taylor Swift's hand at the MTV Awards, because that, of course, was a parody of that, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. remembers when he ripped the award. So get this, one night I'm watching Late Night with Seth Meyers, like this is like in the last year, and Seth Meyers is talking about this sketch he wrote for Kanye West. It's the one I'm in, and he shows a little blip, and then he says this, can you believe that we wrote that sketch in 2007, and Kanye West didn't rip that award out of Taylor Swift's hand until 2009? So I was psychic, says Seth Meyers, because it, that hadn't even happened yet. So it was so funny, Glenn. That because sketch probably gave Kanye the idea to do it. <laughs> That's what Seth Meyers said. It probably gave him the uh, the idea to do that. So that was like just uh, amazing to be in that sketch because we did it like five times. We shot it because uh, it was one of those sketches where it wasn't live. It's, yeah, it's pre-recorded. Yeah, yeah, we were in like Thursday night, Thursday to pre-record. So we did it like five different times, and it's always a challenge to know what can I do that can add to the sketch without stealing focus. Like the sketch is clearly not about me. It's Kanye West. It's my daughter, you know, ripping the thing. 
But I was like, what can I do? And I thought of some silent bits I could do that I thought would add to the humor. And that's the one that they went with, that that one where I added some stuff. So I was so pleased that um, that it worked and that uh, to be in that sketch, I have something written by Seth Meyers, brilliant. I love, even now I love watching him every night, such a brilliant comedian and a monologuist, you know? So um, that was the, the biggest thrill, just those two things. And then outside of uh, Saturday Night Live, to have just shot this national TV commercial was a thrill for Colonial Pen Life Insurance. And um, I mean, so many, so many like lovely things, but, but definitely Saturday Night Live, since that was always my thing growing up, that was a real, real treat. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sharon, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing your stories and Sharon coming on, sharing your stories. Sharon, 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 you should, you should use that. Sharon, Sharon stories or something like that. But, uh, I can't thank you. I think I can't thank you enough for coming on. Wasps and Jews get getting along, talking on a, talking on a podcast. Anything's possible. <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> well, listen. In the world. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, any links, plugs, socials you want to, you want to put out there? Sure. Uh, anyone can visit my website at SharonGeller.com. You can see a whole bunch of stuff that I've done. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, it would be a pleasure if you want to give me a shout out and say hello. And I've also got, of course, the YouTube channel, the mandatory YouTube channel, uh, Sharon Geller. We'll see a lot of different corporate events that I do and, and different things that I do. So a whole myriad of different things. And uh, feel free to check in and say hi. And, I, and I'll say hi back. Hell yeah. Well, Sharon, um, uh, viewers, uh, links are in the description below. And Sharon, uh, don't go anywhere. We'll talk a little bit offline um, okay. before we close. To the viewers out there, if you want to become an honorary member of the Zombie Squad, send me some, uh, hit me up on, on any of the socials. Um, send me the name that you want to be credited as, as your as an honorary member of Zombie Squad. Send me your favorite one or two profile pictures, avatars, what have you, your profile pictures on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, and we can squad you up. I will make you an honorary member of the Zombie Squad, and, I, I'll, des and, and I'll design all this stuff. I'll design a t-shirt, I'll design your logo, your whole s Zombie Squad kind of profile. If you wanna be an honorary member of Zombie Squad, and give you the options to buy a t-shirt to buy a phone case to buy a pillow to buy a tapestry to buy a hoodie to whatever the hell you want but if you want to be an mem honorary member of the zombie squad let me know and uh yeah, but you got to put they got to put in the work though all they all they, all they have to all they had to do is send me one or two of their profile pics and uh they'll be an honorary member <laughs> of the zombie squad <laughs>